Okay. Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar uh, with Resilience Cross Borders and ADAA, Building Resilience, Helping Your Child Adapt and Thrive. Um, we are so excited to have our presenters here today. This is our second annual uh, version of this webinar. We always think this is such an important topic to bring together parents, caregivers, uh, and professionals on talking about resilience and helping our children. So I want to start off with a question for our panelists. Hello, everyone. Thanks for being here today. Um, in the most basic sense, how do you best build a sense in children of their empowerment? Dr. Albert, I'll start off with you. Well, the good news is that everyone is already resilient to some extent. So what the goal is to just keep building on that so that we really help fortify our kids for all of the daily challenges as well as the long-term challenges that they have. And we can teach them all those skills. So there's a lot in the literature and experience and writings about what are the factors. And so we'll be talking about those today. Um, what, how I demonstrate resilience to kids and really everybody, um, but it's nice with kids to understand that when they get stressed or they get anxious or they feel like they can't cope. You know, I use the demonstration of a rubber band and I just say, all right, this is when you're calm and you're feeling good and, you know, you have some stress because you're wiggly a little bit, but you're, you're, you can think and you're flexible. When you get stressed, your rubber band stretches and stretches and we don't want it to get to the point that what happens and kids will say, we don't want it to snap. And it's like, exactly. So you're really stretched and we want to teach you some of the skills of calming yourself down, of asserting yourself and what you need, of um, organizing yourself, of asking for help when you need it helping other people and a lot of the other factors. So it's just a great way to demonstrate and it's a way to introduce that they're already pretty cool and we just want to keep adding to that. So I don't know if anybody else wants to add to that. Yeah, um, I'll just add to that. You know, I think one, one way of building resilience is by teaching kids that hard, is actually good. Um, I think, you know, we live in this very perfectionistic culture where we, you know, get the message that things are supposed to be easy and that we're supposed to be good at everything. And I like to tell kids that, you know, if you struggle with something, let's say you struggle with reading or math or social skills, struggling is, is good for your brain. Think of your brain like a muscle. And when you work hard at something, it helps build that muscle. If everything is easy, you don't get that opportunity to build the muscle. So I think helping our kids learn that we're not trying for perfection. There's no such thing as perfection, but rather we're all working to learn and grow and helping our kids sort of tolerate the idea of of imperfection, of making mistakes, of learning from their mistakes. And, um, and I think this is like a growth mindset for them. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of parents are scared to see their kids struggle and suffer. And I think they need to remember that it really is a great practice for them to get through things that are hard. Yeah, yeah. and and to just, piggyback to that it's the effort right so when we put effort towards something we also gain the sense of confidence that we can do it you know it's that the the thinking the mindset of action we can take action about the things we can't control they may not be able to control that you have to move but they can control maybe visiting the new school and getting to know some new people and so I think that is our motto too, the building the muscle of, of resilience and life. 
They look great. Thanks. Um, following up on the conversation of talking about parents, how do we as parents manage concerns of health, physical safety, social media in regards to resilience? Who wants to take that one? Go ahead. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think I think there's that that came really to the forefront during the pandemic. Um, and I think there's different parts to that question. You know, we can take physical health and safety first. Um, you know, we love as parents, we love our children so much. We'd love to have a sense that we can always keep them safe, but we know that that is not the reality. And I think that trying to balance the physical safety with emotional needs is really important, especially at this moment in the pandemic where kids are going back to school. And obviously, you know, we still are confronted with COVID infections, but kids have so much need for um, social and emotional connection and growth. And I think that we as parents need to be able to tolerate the discomfort of allowing our children to take some risk. We've always been confronted with that. And I think that the pandemic sort of kind of led us to facing that head on in a more significant way. Um, I can talk about other things, social media or whatever, but if anybody else wants to add to that, I, mean, I think it's really important as adults that we practice, you know, uh, getting comfortable with uncertainty and, and you know, not having 100% safety. Um, and we, we've always done it as, as parents and caregivers. I don't think we've been necessarily mindful of the fact that that's what we were doing. And I think with COVID, it, it became even clearer that, you know, um, some news is good, some information is good, too much information can lead us down a rabbit hole of worry and rumination and complete avoidance. And you really need to find a, a place in there where you're comfortable, but where there is some mild risk balanced by all the benefits that Dr. Cornfield just mentioned. Yeah. And, you know, the goal is to tolerate a life is uncertain. <clears throat> the and we want them to be able to tolerate some of that and tolerate discomfort. I think it's how to, as a parent, you know, when it's over the top, you know, when there is a line and that it gets tricky. I say, look at the child's functioning. You know, they, can they get the things done that they need to get done? And I don't mean just schoolwork, but in terms of friendships and just functioning or how are they sleeping? Um, you know, have they changed certain patterns? And that can guide us in terms of, is it too much? But, but just like the rubber band, there is, there is a stretch of effort, discomfort that they need to learn how to negotiate. So then we can get them back to a place where they're confident that they can. And sometimes we need to give the extra support when it's just a bit too much. Yeah, that actually answers um, an interesting question we got in from one of our attendees. They're saying that it's clear that doing hard things is important for your child, but how do you know when to keep pushing versus when they need support, or you should just go a different path and try to do something different in order to help your kids thrive? I think it's a push-pull, right? We push, and then if it gets to be too much, we give them, we bolster the supports. Uh, and then it's like teaching them swimming, right? We don't just throw them in the pool. We do the the step by step approach. But if a kid is freaking out in the water, you pull back and you say, "Okay, what are little baby steps that we can do to make it?" So I think you don't stop. You just maybe pull back a little bit, and then you keep moving forward. And Dr. Cornfell, as a pediatrician, you probably deal. You see the broad range of of ages with kids and probably parents knowing, not knowing when to, when it's too much. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's true. It depends on a child's 
uh, age, their strengths, uh, the resources available. I think just as you said, you want to kind of buttress a child's strength in, in all the ways that you can. And also really sort of, you know, build strength and resilience by active listening with kids. You know, when kids are struggling to try not necessarily to go to uh, solution-based conversation or fix-it mode, which of course as parents, we all really want to do because we know, well, we've been through that and this works and that works, but rather to, you know, be in a situation with our children where we're really actively listening to them and hearing how they are feeling and just holding that and having curiosity about it. And um, I think that when kids feel listened to and heard in a non-judgmental way, um, they feel more connected, they feel more safe, and this allows them to um, take risks that you know, might end up with a mistake or, you know, not doing a perfect job. Um, so, you know, as a parent myself, I remember when my son in particular would be anxious about one thing or another about school and, you know, validating for him that it was okay to be nervous and, you know, also encouraging him to sort of um, follow the, the thought pattern as to, you know, what was he nervous about happening, you know, and, and if that happens, then what often made him realize that it, it was probably not as big of a deal as he thought it was, you know. So I think encouraging them to, um, to, to use what they already have, you know, they have a lot of agency, they don't, they're, they're not necessarily aware that they have and letting them know, them know that you believe that they have that and encouraging them to problem solve on their own, huge. We're having um, some conversation in our chat right now about parents whose children struggle opening up and sharing their thoughts and feelings. So how do you build that resilience if they're not quite able to communicate what's causing that anxiety, that uh, school avoidance um, and those feelings? Well, and I think, you know, so much of the time they're not going to say to us, oh, I am anxious about such and such and so and so, or, you know, you might hear words of worry and, you know, especially as they get older, they can express it more. But I think at every age, as parents, we want to listen and open the doors as much as we can and just let them know, you know, it's always there. Um, but we want to watch how they behave too. So if they're starting to withdraw or they're, uh, avoiding school, maybe it's not a full school refusal, but they're starting to say, I have a stomach ache, I have a headache, I can't go to school, you know, look for those patterns. And then you can talk a little bit um, sort of at them for them and just say, you know, a lot of times when kids or teens have stomach aches or shoulder you know, tension, um, it's because they may worry about what if this happens or what if that happens. And I just wonder if sometimes you have it because it's normal to have those thoughts. So you want to normalize a lot of the emotional states. So they don't think they're weird. They don't think they're alone. They know that their peers and in fact, their parents have some of those you know, I run a lot of groups for kids and teens, and I'm always modeling mistakes, sometimes on purpose, <laughs> sometimes it's not on purpose, and I just make a mistake, and I just say, oh, you know, I made a mistake, wow, well, I wonder what you think of that, because, you know, as with kids, and especially teens, there's a lot of social anxiety and worry about judgment, so I'll sort of say, oh, I wonder what you might have thought. I worry sometimes about if I make a mistake, you know, what will happen? And sometimes I even then don't want to do something and talk about avoidance because that is the hallmark of a lot of the, of, of anxiety. But the thing to be with resilience is actually taking initiative and being proactive instead of withdrawing. So we're always, always encouraging it. And as I said, like with baby steps. So if a kid doesn't want to go to school, 
you know, you, you break it down into smaller chunks, and, but you keep moving forward. Yeah. And, and just in response to the, the question that um, the parent from the chat asked, you know, I think that even when kids are not being clearly and openly communicative with us, that doesn't mean that they don't want the connection. I think most kids really crave connection with the important adults in their life. And sometimes the way they behave gives us a different feeling. They're pushing us away, they're rejecting us. And, you know, depending on their age, there's so many developmental tasks they have of differentiating and separating from us. But through it all, kids crave that connection with us. And sometimes it's very tricky to figure out how to move that along, how to get them to open up. And I think just keeping your eyes open and being attuned for those moments where you might be able to connect. I think, you know, it's hard to connect with a kid if you say, let's sit down and talk and you're just face to face. But sometimes, you know, if you have, if you're driving them to a soccer game or you're, you know, putting them to bed at night, you know, depending on what their age is, and you just, you know, open up a conversation when it's relaxed, when it's not threatening, um, you can get little moments of opening and connection that, you know, sort of pays the, paves the way to um, being able to kind of communicate and really understand what's going on. You know, I think it's really important as parents or caregivers that we have the ability to be in the moment, in those moments that you referenced. And, um, you know, kids are so busy these days. Everybody's so busy these days. Um, they can be few and far between. So I think it's really important that we make sure that we as parents can be present without, you know, our own ruminating, worrying, et cetera. And, and so, you know, one thing you can model for your kids is that if, if something like that is happening, that's getting in the way of you being the best parent you want to be or the best professional you want to be, that there are things that we can do about that, that there's treatment out there, that there is, you know, a lot of self-help guidance online, you know, mindfulness and meditation can help, et cetera. So um, I think it's, it's really important that we as parents make sure that we're treating whatever's going on with us as well. Right. And I think it's, it's really easy as, as, you know, parents, we're, we're human beings when our kids are, you know, going through difficult stages, and they're dysregulated, acting out, yelling at us, being disrespectful or rude, you know, it's easy to feel pushed away. But rather, you know, oftentimes, you know, there is a bid for attention in there, a bid for closeness and connection. And to just keep remembering and sort of telling ourselves that, you know, that even as we're feeling pushed away from our kids, they really want that closeness with us and just really, you know, figuring out ways to, to make that happen. It's, it's not easy. <laughs> We have a few questions about not wanting to be overbearing with their kids and not wanting to over accommodate um, if they do have um, potentially a pre existing condition, if they suffer from anxiety, if they suffer from depression. So, how do you go about managing um, a disorder or their mental health while also taking the first step towards building that confidence and building that resilience? Well, there's actually a whole um, program called SPACE and it's helping parents so that they don't accommodate too much. You know, as a parent, you love your children. You don't want to see them suffering. And when they start needing a lot of reassurance, this is where I see parents starting to give it. It's normal to give your children reassurance, but then watch, is this a recurring pattern? You know, do they keep asking, you know, what if this happens and what am I going to do and how can I handle it? Even if they don't say it with words, particularly younger kids, 
you may just see that they just get stuck in something. So it's looking for patterns and then, uh, you know, not accommodating. If somebody keeps asking the question of, you know, I just remember a little boy every day would say, am I sick today? Am I sick today? And we got the parent to say, well, what do you think? You know, do you think you have a fever? Do you think? And the kid could then start reassuring themselves. So there's a lot of strategies. And part of being resilient is, is learning the skills of independence. So even a three-year-old can push a recycling bin down, you know, to the bottom of a driveway, if that's what you have, you know, so you can do small tasks, you wouldn't ask them to do a big task. And all of it, I think, builds that sense of authentic self-esteem, not just, oh, you're so great, but you can do this and you can do that. And like, that was, that was hard and look at how you've done it. So it's um, taking those steps. And I think parenting is one of the most challenging uh, tasks that we have ahead of us, because first of all, you know, kids are different. So what we do with one doesn't necessarily work with the other. And there isn't the, the comprehensive ma manual that tells us what to do about everything. But if we listen to their words and watch their behaviors and their patterns, it can give us a real sense of how do we move forward. Anyone want to add to that? I saw in the chat a lot of people are mentioning the space programs. And I believe there is, someone asked about referrals. I believe, um, Mary, you can confirm this. There's a website that yes. should have uh, resources all over the country where space is being offered. Right. Um, it's very hot right now. So more and more people are getting training in it. And it's, it's a great uh, offering. And I would say, in, you know, in most... Um, areas there, there, uh, Dr. Leibowitz, who has been working in this area of family accommodation for more than a decade, uh, started doing these trainings pre-pandemic, and then the pandemic actually opened it up more because he could do more of them because they were virtual and people could join all over. So there are, there is a website of people who are approved. Uh, leaders in this, and some of them are done individually with just one family, and then others are done as a, a group model. Um, but even beyond, he, he wrote a book, um, so it's Ellie Leibowitz, and I can't think of the book right now, but it, it's about helping parents not accommodate as much. Because again, as there's this push-pull, right, we want to we want to take care of them and embrace them and make it so that they're not hurting. On the other hand, if they don't figure some of this out, they're a, not motivated maybe to push themselves when it's uncomfortable and they don't learn those skills. They even have the book right now. It's somewhere. Somewhere I have it here. <laughs> it's a great is actually part of our public education program. Oh, wonderful. Wonderful. He does great work. Yeah, um, that actually brings me to a question. So how do we keep our own anxiety from negatively impacting our kids? There are so many things happening um, in the world, especially. So how do we manage that? No, I, I mean, obviously you can seek out professional treatment and, and there's certainly, you know, a lot of things available online now. Um, one of the things that came out of COVID that was actually a positive is the, the availability of a lot of really free resources that can be really helpful. Um, you know, I, I do think we have to be careful because part of the reason why kids develop anxiety is environmental. You know, you can't do much to change your kids' genetic uh, components, but you can change their environment. So I think it's, you know, it's important to let them know that anxiety is a normal, acceptable emotion, but that when it really starts to take over and impact, you know, your ability to do the things that you want to do, that it's something that, that needs to change. Um, and so there's some great treatment out there. There's, you know, plenty of evidence-based psychotherapies that have really great, um, you know, efficacy for, for anxiety and anxiety disorders. And, you know, there's also plenty of things that we can do 
on our own that help lower our anxiety. So great self-care, you know, getting plenty of sleep, respecting your need for sleep, nutrition, moving your body, getting outside, um, you know, learning to meditate, those kinds of things can be really, really helpful, especially when all combined. And I think the mentioning of physical health and its connection to mental health is an important part of the conversation as well. Um, the two are very much linked. Uh, we do have a question coming in about um, kind of anxiety that has came about since the pandemic. And is there anything that you guys have seen as professionals on how children have been impacted differently since the pandemic in terms of developing anxiety and other disorders? Yeah, I mean, I think that, um, you know, the social isolation obviously has had a huge impact on kids um, being um, surrounded by news media coverage, hearing about death, feeling, you know, I mean, kids at different ages all are already afraid of their parents. I mean, kids are always afraid of something bad happening to their parents and family. And I think being confronted with, with the reality of this through the pandemic has been really, really hard on kids. And I think, you know, the excessive exposure that they had to social media, much of it, you know, because they needed it to keep their social connections, to learn, to be engaged in school. Obviously, there's a lot of benefits that kids get from social media in terms of connection and growth and learning, but they're also exposed to, you know, a lot of negative uh, cultural things. They're exposed to shame, body shaming, they're exposed to prejudice, they're exposed to, you know, pornography, they're exposed to a lot of very negative things. Um, and so I think, you know, fear and anxiety and difficulties have really been exacerbated during the pandemic. Um, you know, I think that helping kids, you know, we've discussed a lot of the ways to help kids calm their anxiety. Um, but I think, you know, as Dr. Salcedo mentioned, I think some of it does begin with us, which is difficult. I mean, we are afraid of our children's safety. And yet, we need to be examples of calm in the storm to some extent. I mean, it's okay for kids to see us experiencing pain and sadness, but I think if kids see us feeling excessive anxiety around you know, exposure to infection or bad things happening from the pandemic, I think at this point, that's fueling an anxiety where now at this point in the pandemic, I think as parents, we need to kind of ground ourselves in the reality that we are safer now than we were, you know, a year or two years ago. And that many people are vaccinated, um, that this infection has become at this point in time less virulent and that, you know, our kids, you know, as we talked about earlier, nobody's ever going to be completely safe. I mean, our kids face, you know, danger every day as we do walking outside of the house. But I think really trying to stay in realistic thinking and not catastrophic thinking about the level of, of, of danger that we are now facing in the pandemic and allowing our kids to sort of move out from our, you know, kind of enclosed spaces and, um, you know, needing to quarantine to really getting back into their lives and connecting with people and taking, you know, age appropriate risks. And just for all the parents, we have to take care of ourselves and we have to think about what helps us de-stress, what helps us calm down. Um, you know, for many of us, anxiety has served a very positive purpose. 
And so we have to remember that anxiety up to a certain point helps motivate us. It helps us say, oh my gosh, we have to study. We're having a test where we have this meeting coming up. We have to prepare. And so that is helpful and productive anxiety. And then when it gets to the point where it starts paralyzing us or slowing us down or sending us in the wrong direction, then that becomes the unproductive anxiety that we really have to, you know, really analyze how, how can we think about it differently. So it's a point we are role models for our children. And we're also role models in how we take care of ourselves. Like you said, making mistakes or I got really stressed out about this, but then I came up with a plan and just helping have a plan was really great. But you know, plan A wasn't enough. So I had a plan, plan B and a C and you know, there's 26 letters in alphabet. I can have plans up to Z, <laughs> you know, just talking out loud, which also helps us deal with our own stress. Thanks. Um, how can we help kids and teens challenge their unhelpful thinking about the challenges of school? So, you know, there are so many, um, and I, I thank you, and I have a, a, a short video that um, we actually made. The nonprofit is training teachers in um, economically marginalized schools and so that we can do a universal intervention for all children. And so we're making videos for some of these um, to normalize sort of what we all do, what we all think. And catastrophizing is something that's part of anxiety that we tend to kind of go to the extreme in thinking. Self-talk is a key that we wanna teach kids that they always think things. And sometimes their thoughts are neutral, like, oh, I wonder what is for lunch today, right? But we have, we're, our mind is filled with so many. So we challenge it with sort of some reality checks, like what's the likelihood that something awful is going to happen? Um, what I say to teens is, what would you tell your friend in the same situation or thinking the same thought that often immediately because they wouldn't tell their friend oh you're so stupid that you can't eat, you can't do this or you're avoiding it um you know you would be encouraging and say you know if you keep trying you probably can do it and you can ask for help if you can't do it we don't have to do everything by ourselves so those reality checks are really critical so hope you enjoyed it. We're, these are not yet for release. I think there may be a question that in, um, we are starting with our pilot. We have probably 15 to 20 videos and uh, we're going to launch it this year in several schools. And then hopefully then we can release it on a broader level because we really, the nonprofit, the charity, um, which Dr. Kornfeld and Dr. Salcedo and are part of the board and I'm on the board and founded it. We really want to get this information to everybody, which is why we're doing this panel today too, is really get it because we all have the power to change our lives to certain extents. We can't change everything, but we can do so much. And we want to teach the kids at a young age that they have that power too. So get off my softbox. I get very, very excited about all this. So oh, we're, we're happy to hear it. Um, I'd like to just take us back to kind of maybe the beginning of it all and ask what ideas do each of you have about how to build resilience in children? Like if you were doing a step one, um, what would be your recommendation? Yeah, I, I'll start with um, one thing that was brought up, but just to build on it a little bit is the concept of mindfulness, which I think that we can start teaching kids that at a very young age. Um, you know, I think one way to 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 teach kids mindfulness is to take a walk with them in the woods and say, let's play a game 
where we're focusing on all of our different senses. Let's first focus on our eyes and let's look at all the different colors that we see in the woods. Okay, now let's focus on our ears. And let's try to hear all the different bird sounds we can hear and all the different insect sounds we can hear and anything we hear in the distance, a plane or a train. Um, let's focus on our, our bodies now. Let's feel how it feels to walk in the woods. Let's feel how it feels on our feet, how the air feels on our hands and our arms. And I think just by teaching kids to be aware of their bodies and to be able to ground themselves in the present because, you know, we all know because we all do it. We're always worrying about what we did yesterday and stewing about what's going to happen tomorrow. And it's very hard to stay grounded in the present, which of course we all know is really the only thing we can control what we're doing right now at this moment. And I think you know, helping kids learn that and helping kids learn that they can pay attention to their emotions, pay attention to how their emotions feel in their body and learn how to calm their bodies down. I think, you know, at a very young age, we can teach kids how to take slow breaths in, you know, you can do it anyway, eight breaths in, hold for eight, eight seconds in, hold for eight seconds, slowly release. And what we do is, you know, when we're in a stress panic state, our, you know, our epinephrine, our cortisol shoots up. When we slow our bodies down and take slow, deep breaths, we turn on our parasympathetic nervous system, which calms our activated nervous system and really allows us to, you know, take our nervous system down to a more calm state. So I think the more we can practice this with kids when they're not in a dysregulated, you know, highly emotionally charged state, the more they're able to utilize that skill when they are in a difficult situation. I practiced the eight step breathing while you were speaking. <laughs> Did it help? It did. <laughs> yeah. it, it's pretty amazing when someone's, you know, feeling panicky, if they do this breathing, how quickly they feel physically better, you know? And so I think giving kids those very concrete skills to see how they can easily change the way they're feeling is really important. And it's important for us too, frankly, as adults. Yeah, and just to piggyback what couple of ways with younger kids, we use pinwheels sometimes and we have them blow oh. out. And then what happens is you naturally have to suck in the air. So it's sort of the opposite of what we've done. and. Um, you know, blowing bubbles, anything that blowing out um, with the young kids is, is really a great way to teach them the, to self-regulate because self-regulation is one of the protective factors of, of resilience. Um, we also, with younger, we do five finger breathing. So it's like breathe in, breathe out, breathe in, breathe out. And so you can do it in a very concrete way. Um, so I would say self-regulation in so many ways and the mindfulness, um, I love that activity of walking in the woods and, or walking anywhere and using all of your senses and without judging. And that's the key because we judge so much of ourselves all the, all the time. And I would add, I guess, as my choice of what key protective factor with resilience is that knowing again, and I said it, while well, you can't control everything, there's so much that you can control and you can do something about it. So when the pandemic first hit, I was working with a group of kids, actually the, you know, the, the day everything shut down, I had a group two days later and I said, all right, we're here, you're now home, you're not in school, what can you control? because we know what we can't control. Like there was so much going on and kids came up with, well, 
I can control it. I can now go outside a little bit. I can control how you use my free time. I can control what I do with my siblings. I can control, you know, um, when I take a nap or go to bed. I mean, simple things that we need to reinforce that they do. We're not out of control of our lives. We have a lot of opportunities to, I guess, impact our own lives. And so for me, that's the biggest uh, sense of self-mastery, the sense of self-efficacy is, I think, at the core. Oh, yeah. Um, I mean, that works for parents, too, if we, you go back and think about what you can control when sometimes you feel a little overwhelmed. Right. Um, so how do you know when it's time to seek treatment or when it is a normal, healthy amount of anxiety? I can speak for the adults. Um, certainly, you know, Mary, uh, Dr. Alvord referenced when it becomes paralyzing. So, you know, anxiety is a normal response. And as she said, it can really, you know, push us in the right direction often. But sometimes it, you know, is, is ruminative and persistent and it's with you for much longer than it should given whatever the trigger is. And so if it's getting in the way of you being present in your work or with your family, um, if it's distracting for you in, in a lot of different ways, if it's causing you physical symptoms where you can't sleep or you're feeling uncomfortable in your body, um, it's probably time to actively do something about it. And that can look like a lot of different things. You know, it can be as simple as, you know, taking on a mindfulness program, or it can be, you know, seeking out professional treatment through a variety of means. But I think mostly when it starts to get in your way in, in one area of your life or another, that's when you probably need to actively do something about it. And just to speak to, um, you know, some issues with with children where you might consider getting help. I mean, obviously, there's, as Dr. Salcedo said, the level of functioning um, that is true for kids too. the level of functioning or sort of significant unhappiness. But I think a lot of anxiety and distress and difficult emotions guilt, jealousy, pain, grief, um, you know, as parents, we can tap into resources to be able to help our kids manage different emotions. And that, you know, as we talked about earlier, negative emotions and difficult emotions are not pathologic. They're part of the human experience. And we all have them. We wish we didn't, but we all do. And they live beside joy and excitement and all of the wonderful emotions that we have too. And I think that, you know, if as a parent, you are helping a child through a different difficult situation, say uh, the death of a grandparent, um, and you are helping them in whatever ways you can, you're talking about it, you're asking questions, you're holding their pain, you're reading books, you're, you know, helping them. And at a certain point, you feel that you've reached, you're tapped out, you've reached the limit of what you know, or what you can offer, and you feel that you are really worried about your child. That's a time perhaps first to reach out to your pediatrician and maybe your pediatrician can be the first um, go-to to help navigate a difficult situation. And then, you know, at some point, perhaps the pediatrician will say, let's get some more help and refer to a therapist. Mm -hmm. And sometimes even before the therapist, I mean, I agree the pediatrician and primary care Docs for parents sometimes help <clears throat> navigate that, but the pediatrician and then the school counselor, especially at the elementary school level, they can be very helpful and, and provide some resources. And, and then there are also organizations, um, ADA amongst them that has resources, <clears throat> resilience across borders. We have some blogs that we have put up 
to help with some resources. The American Psychological Association um, has a, a, used to have a help center, but now they call it topics. But you in the search box can just put resilience and a whole bunch of content will come up and help you. But there are also find a provider um, and the abct.org, which is the Association of Behavioral and uh, cognitive and yeah, I belong to it. The uh, Behavioral and Cognitive Therapies has um, not only a find a provider, but they have recommended self help books. They really guide, and there's so many books for young kids that um, you know it, it's help teach emotion. And again, it's how much does it get in your way? Getting back to when do you know? I My rule of thumb is intensity and frequency. So if something is happening way too often and it's um, you know really more severe and it's a break in a pattern. So suddenly your, your team doesn't have any of the friend, same friend group, they've switched that's a sign maybe of difficulty. And again, it doesn't necessarily mean you rush to a therapist, but you can talk to the school counselor and find out maybe what's going on. So some of what we do as parents is detective work. And then we do detective work in terms of finding resources and help as well. Yeah, so uh, I'm gonna start with Dr. Salcedo for this question. How do you know if your child needs medication? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> So, you know, it's a, it's a similar issue. I mean, um, you know, one of the problems that we're having right now is lack of avail availability of therapists who see kids and have open after school time. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, if you call um, my office or Dr. Alvord's office right now, you're going to get told that you are going to need to put your child on a wait list. So, you know, for us, typically, um, starting with good evidence-based psychotherapy is the way to go for most kids. Um, but if that's not available, I, I, would, I would consider medication. And certainly if you've tried good evidence-based psychotherapy and the child is not responding, um, that's, that's an indication that a medication evaluation might be a good next step. Um, you know, I, I think one thing that ADAA does really well is it describes what good evidence-based psychotherapy is. And um, so knowing, you know, what kind of treatment your child is getting and what the components should be um, will help you to really figure out, you know, if, if your child is, is receiving the treatment that is warranted given what's going on with them. And then I'll, I'm sure Dr. Kornfeld has more thoughts about that. Yeah. Yeah, no, I agree with everything you've said. I mean, I think that there, you know, with kids, we, you know, will often, you know, it, want to engage in some type of psychotherapy before going to medication. Um, but if, you know, a child is, you know, working with family, working with therapists, um, and they are really falling off their developmental trajectory in life. They are not able to go to school. They're not able to engage with peers. They are not able, you know, they've, you know, sort of lost their joy and their desire to engage in things. They're having somatic symptoms of, you know, headaches, stomach aches that are really debilitating. Um, and, you know, therapy is not working. Um, I think at that point, medication would be considered. And from a non-medical, since I'm the only non-MD here, um, I would say as, as a longtime therapist there, you know, when a kid presents with ADHD, immediately make sure that they're assessed so they're not a lot of learning disabilities or learning differences that get in the way or other emotional um, and then punt them back to the pediatrician to take a look. Um, with ADH, the, the gold standard is the medication as well as behavioral intervention. With other things, because we do evidence-based and we do a lot of exposure therapy and a lot of it is very difficult to do. It works and it's great, but it sometimes kids need medication to just take 
the edge off of them so that they're more available. And then we monitor it because I think, you know, the, the goal is to be as little medication as possible, um, but yet find that right sweet spot so you can make progress and then move on. With ADHD, you know, as a pediatrician, you probably know a lot of kids are on it longer term. Um, but for others, sometimes it's, it's other things. So. Great. Um, we are getting close to time, so I just want to be sure uh, that we touch upon a few key takeaways. So if you could provide oh, yeah. um, our audience today kind of one piece of advice or one thing to take home to their children or for themselves. What would that be? We made a slide for that. So let me see if I can share that, but we can talk it through. Perfect. Mm -hmm. So who wants to take the first one? We can elaborate and then we can anything else. And I, I guess I would, before we do, I would ask um, the all the participants that Think about maybe three key concepts or strategies that you got that you feel like you can implement because there's, there's so much that we're talking about. So that's why I put the little toolbox up there. You know, what are three, three takeaways or three tools maybe that, that you have gotten? So as we sort of talk it through, there's more than this, but just keep that in mind. You want me to start? Yes. <laughs> okay. I'm sorry. Okay. Um, so mental flexibility is what we know is key to really psychological health. That if you can not get stuck on things, know that nothing is perfect, that we make mistakes, and that you can detour when the road is closed there are detours and you can find maybe multiple detours. And if you need to find the GPS to help you out off the road, that's where you, you think flexibly is like, who can I reach out to that is a support or can help me? We don't have to do this alone. That's, you know, the big message. So, so often we feel so responsible for everything that happens with our kids and, and everything in our lives. Um, that we forget, we don't have to do it, you know, all alone. So find a few ways that you can manage it for yourself. You don't have to have the toolkit filled to the brim yet, but we want you to keep adding to that, but think flexibly. I will take embrace imperfection and model self-compassion. Okay. Um, being a parent is absolutely the most beautiful, wonderful thing that I have done in my life. And it is also the hardest thing that I've done in my life. And what I ask all the parents here is to look back on your parenting and to not beat yourself up for what you perceive as mistakes, but rather to say, I did the best I could with the resources that I had at the time. And we are constantly growing and we are constantly changing. And I salute every parent in this audience right now, because obviously you are all here because you are trying to be better parents. And that is such a beautiful thing. And when, you know, when we model that we have made a mistake and we, are trying to be better, we're giving our kids permission to do the same thing. Well, I will take focus on what you can control and change. Um, and I think we've talked about that a little bit today. I, I would say that focusing on the positives and uh, another uh, bullet point, practicing gratitude, um, those things are huge. It's, it is very easy for us to turn our attention only to the negatives or the, the one thing out of 40 that we didn't do that day. Um, so I think it's really important on a day-to-day -day basis that you 
for yourself, but also modeling for your kids, focus on the, the good pieces of the day, the things you accomplished, um, whether it was just, you know, holding the door open for somebody who was struggling, um, but to be able to focus on, on the good things in your life and to make that be, you know, part of your day, like, like brushing your teeth is a part of your day, but hopefully more frequently than that. And I know we only have a minute, so I'll just reiterate the remember you're not alone and remind your kids that they're not alone. They're not the only ones struggling. They're also not the only ones having the joy. They're also um, part of a group maybe that has some of the same interests or hobbies that we have. So when we say you're not alone, it's you're not alone in so many ways. The other thing is you don't have to do it all yourself. Um, that's something that I've really struggled. I'm always trying to do things. And somebody said, well, you know, you can ask somebody else to do that. Um, and so think about how can you have the support, but maybe divvy up some tasks so that your load at a certain time is less. And when you can handle more, you can do more, but always sharing responsibilities. So I think, you know, as hopefully what we're giving today, the message is we're not perfect. No one is perfect. Parenting is super hard, but it is a joyful experiencing. And now I have two little grandbabies. So I am really joyful over the moon because um, I'm not as responsible either. So I can really take a lot of more step back and, and in the enjoyment too. Thank you. Everybody. What are the little hearts that keep showing up? On <laughs> <laughs> they are from our attendees who are having a, such appreciation for. Ah, today. I love it. I've never seen that before. Uh, Thank we, you. Thank Mary, you. Mary, if you want to just switch the slides, we can share some resources. So we do have a lot of great resources. Again, if you are in crisis, 988 is the uh, crisis hotline that is now available. So if you are in need of someone to talk to and need crisis support, please be sure to use that. Um, ADAA has tons of wonderful resources. Find a therapist database, a free online peer-to-peer -peer support group. Um, we do have some book resources. We saw, I saw a question reflecting that, so I'd be happy to share that. I'm going to email afterwards, but also you can visit our website. And also, as Dr. Alvord mentioned, Resilience Across Borders has great blog posts and resources, so be sure to visit their website. And if you do have questions, as we've mentioned today, please be sure to touch base with your pediatrician, your healthcare provider, your school counselors, your teachers. Um, they're your kind of first line of defense, but also professional mental health is available. Um, so I want to thank our speakers for joining us today for bringing such important conversations and for all of our attendees. Um, it has been wonderful sharing this time with you. Thank you. Thanks to everybody. Thanks Thank so you. much. Bye-bye.